As embed systems become smaller and smaller, it's becoming more and more practical for hobbyists to begin investing in solder reflowing tools. One of these tools is the T962 oven. Despite this oven receiving poor reviews, new aftermarket firmware has been developed alongside other modifications, resolving many of the oven's initial problems. To make the T962 a serious contender in the competition for the best solder reflow tool for hobbyists. If you own this oven, or if you're shopping around for a tool to solder reflow, then this video will probably be very useful to you. So what can you expect to see from this video? First, I'll briefly introduce the T962 oven in its original form or out of the box. Second, I'll explain why this oven, along with modifications, could be a good fit for you and your applications. Third, I'll talk about the possible modifications you can make and provide a step-by-step -step guide implementing them. So if you're not aware by now, this T962 oven is very notorious. Many people are divided on whether or not this is a good product for solder reflow use, and I can certainly understand both sides. So let's do a simple pros and cons analysis on this oven. Some of the pros are it's very cheap. It's only about $200 on Amazon. The T962 is also relatively aesthetic. It's packaged nicely, especially when you compare it to a modified toaster oven model. And it also has some pretty decent hardware for the cost. So for the cons, the first one is the loud and annoying fan at the side, which will constantly be running when you have the oven on, and it's just sounds petty, but it's pretty annoying. The second point is some of the implementation is pretty sketchy, and this might kind of seem really vague, and it is, but it will make much more sense later in the video. Another point is the uneven heat distribution that's reported with this oven, and some people have even reported that they've been burning their boards with it. And the last point is the poor software, which kind of ties into the third point as well. Now, I haven't really experimented too much with the unmodified version of this oven. So some of the cons I'm listing here are from reports of other users. With that said, let's try reflowing a board with the T962 out of the box. I did manage to reflow one board pretty well with the oven out of the box. In this example, I just used one of my old Kronos Mega boards and simply put some solder paste and a couple of components onto it. Because of the reports made by some people that the oven has a tendency to burn boards, I made sure to set the reflow profile to one with a low peak temperature setting. When the board was finally finished reflowing, the board came out looking good and was not burned. However, since the board is really small, I can't give a good indication on if there are hot spots or not in the oven. So as an out-of-the-box unit, it works pretty okay. I'm reluctant to use this oven on some of my larger boards in the future, however, given the reviews left by many others with damaged boards. But the reason why I bought this oven is because there now exists third-party firmware that someone can flash to this oven. This firmware, along with a handful of other modifications, have so far been receiving positive feedback in regards to adding much better performance to this oven. I've currently made these modifications, and so far I'm very happy with these results. Later in this video, I'll show you step-by-step -step instructions how to make these mods to your T962 oven. So my conclusion of this product is that it would be a good choice for using for your reflow soldering needs, provided the following points. Number one is that you value your time and you don't want to spend all your time modifying a toaster oven. An alternative to using the T962 is buying a reflow controller in which many cases will take a while to install and set up. And number two is that you're not really a big fan of the packaging method for external reflow controllers. If you don't know what I'm referring to, it's the products like the Reflow Stir or the Reflow Kit from the Beta E Store. These products, according to buyers, are great performers, so they're also a really good option to consider. However, I'm personally not crazy about how the final result is packaged. For what it's worth, most of these also do not have any fan control. Number three is that you make the necessary modifications to the T962, which may sound contradictory to the first point, but it really doesn't take that long to make these necessary modifications to the oven, especially since I'll be showing you how to do this in this video. And number four is that you are only working on hobbyist level applications for reflowing. Obviously, the modified T962 is not designed for professional applications. These points apply to me, so in my situation, I think this modded T962 is a great fit for my solder reflowing needs. So now I'll move on to the modifications to make to the T962. There are five that I'm covering here, and they are the masking tape replacement, the grounding in the case of the oven, flashing third-party firmware, adding fan control, and also adding the cold junction sensor. 
Out of all these, replacing the masking tape is the one modification that I would say is pretty much required, but I'll explain that one later. Obviously, you don't have to do all five mods here that I cover, but some of these mods depend on the other mods to do them. So just to clarify that, here is a dependency chart. As you can see, replacing the masking tape and also grounding the top case component of the oven are completely separate and can be done independently from the other modifications. There's nothing else that depends on doing these modifications. However, these three ones are joined together. The firmware flashing modification is necessary for the cold junction sensor and also the fan control modification. For all these mods that I will show you, I have a parts bomb created for each of the mod modifications separately. To get this modifications bomb, just simply go to the description of this video and open the shared Google Drive. There you will see a Google Sheets file that is this bomb. As a disclaimer, I must remind you that if you are to make these modifications, there will be exposed main voltage lines and you must be very careful. Main voltage can kill you. Never reach inside the oven while you have the power cable connected. Whenever you start working on the oven, flip the switch off and remove the cable. Wait a few moments and then you can start working. When you want to turn the oven back on, plug the cable back in and flip the switch. But again, never reach inside the oven while the power cable is connected. By making the following modifications, you assume the risk involved. Also a pretty good list on the safety rules for working with electrical equipment is listed in the description. And you can also click on the caption shown in your screen now. The first modification we'll do is replacing the masking tape with capped on tape. This is the one that I said you pretty much should do whether you want to or not. Inside the oven, masking tape is used in multiple sections. There have been many reports of people saying that this masking tape will burn up during oven use and it creates a really nasty smell. To get started, switch off the oven and unplug the power cable. Simply remove all the screws around the edge on the back for the top component, which are these highlighted ones here. You also need to remove the two screws hidden by the drawer at the front. When all the screws have been removed, the top section of the oven should be able to slide forward quite easily. Be careful handling the top component as it is still connected with wire harnesses, and you could damage the connections. Right away you'll see at the front of the oven there is a bunch of masking tape. Remove all of that masking tape and then lift the lip of the front metal sheet. You'll see some insulation, but underneath that you'll also find a sort of flimsy bookmark looking thing that is also wrapped in a bunch of masking tape. Remove all of that masking tape as well. Now get started with the capped on tape. Start covering the sections of the oven with the capped on tape in the same manner the masking tape was formerly placed. Start with the flimsy bookmark and place it back in its appropriate spot. Then start taping the metal sheet and the edges to seal it in place. After that, just screw the top lid and you're done with that mod. However, if you want to keep making modifications, you can just leave that top lid off. The next mod is grounding the top component of the chassis. This mod is a bit divided among people, kind of in the same way people are divided on whether or not they need to ground the case of their PC. I think everyone admits that this is a good thing to do, but I guess it depends on how much of a rebel you want to be. The logic, in case you're not aware, is that if a live hot wire by some act of God gets severed internally and touches the case, then you could touch the case and get a nasty jolt. So the idea is that if you ground the case, you'll have a short and something else will fry instead of you. This is an easy mod, all you need is a thick wire and two eyelets. First of all, check to make sure that even the bottom portion of the case is grounded. You can see where it's supposed to be grounded with this wire, but in my case the paint was preventing a connection. You can check to see if the bottom is grounded by checking the continuity between a screw on the back to the earth ground pin on the oven. If the bottom is not grounded, unbolt the wire from the case and take something to scrape the paint off the screw area. Solder an eyelet to one end of the thick wire, here I'm using speaker wire. Loop the eyelet on the bolt to the case. Solder the other eyelet onto the other end of the wire. I decided to connect the other end of the wire to the bolt on the small fan. Now is a good time to check to see if the top and the bottom components of the case are properly grounded using a multimeter. The main mod in this video is the flashing of the firmware created by Unified Engineering in Sweden. This new firmware pretty much is a complete upgrade over the original, and it adds a ton of new features. For one, the firmware makes use of the cold junction sensor we will add later. This adds significantly better accuracy alone because by default the stock firmware always assumes a cold junction point is at 20 degrees Celsius. But here we will be measuring the cold junction sensor. 
Also, you will be able to gain control of the little noisy fan at the side with an additional modification. This might not seem necessary, but trust me that this oven is significantly less annoying without that annoying ring going all the time. With this new firmware, the little fan will only turn on if the system starts getting too hot. Another great thing about this firmware is that it's much smarter with the main fan. With the stock firmware, this fan isn't turned on until the cooldown period. However, during heating, it can be used to mix the air gently in the oven to provide a much more even heat distribution. The firmware also adds a gain and offset control to each of the two thermocouples independently for calibration purposes. You can also customize the speed at which the fan runs at for mixing the oven air. Then there's a manual bake mode which can be useful for calibration or niche applications. For what it's worth, the new firmware is also significantly more responsive and aesthetically pleasing than the original firmware. To get started, you will obviously have to have the oven opened up, so this means the power should not be plugged in. For ease and use, I started removing a lot of the connections to the main board. However, during programming, the board must be powered, so leave the three pin connector in the corner and the two pin one here. Keep track of what connections plug in where so you're not confused later on. Remove the hot glue from the connections if you have to. On the main board, you can see a set of five male header pins. If you position the board so that way the letters ISP and the silk screen can be read upright, the pin order goes like this from left to right. NISP, Reset, TXD, RXD, and Ground solder jumpers at each of these headers to break them out. Next on the ISP programmer, remove the DTR to reset jumper, then connect the ground TXD and reset pins on the programmer to the appropriate pins coming from the ISP on the oven. Here I used a breadboard. Wire the NISP in the reset node to buttons that will short the nodes to the ground when pressed. Don't put any pull-up resistors on these, just allow the nodes to float if the button is unpressed. If all of this sounds confusing, here's a schematic that shows what I said to do. The schematic is also available on the shared drive folder linked in the description. We have the hardware setup complete, so now on to the software. So next, download the Flash Magic tool. The link to this is in the description. Here I am using Windows 8, so I will select the appropriate option. While you're online, go to the Unified Engineering's pre-built firmware page and also download the latest hex file. In my case, it was version 0.5.0. Then go through the installation wizard from the Flash Magic executable. It is a very simple setup. Here I also installed the USB drivers along with the tool. When you finally launch Flash Magic, plug in the programmer to your PC and check your device manager to see what COM port the programmer is located on. Set your COM port in Flash Magic to that port. Next, for the microcontroller, select the LPC2134. Choose a baud rate of 57600. The interface should be at none ISP, and the oscillator must be exactly 11.0592 MHz. Plug in the power cable into the T962 and flip the switch. When the oven powers on, do the following steps with the buttons. Press the NISP button to short NISP to ground, then press the reset button. Release the reset button, and then release the NISP button. The sequence of grounding those nodes will place the microcontroller in bootloader mode, at which point you should be set to flash the application. Next, go to ISP and choose Read Device Signature. If it reads successfully, then you know you are connected to the microcontroller. Close the signature windows and ensure erase blocks used by a hex file is checkmarked. Make sure this hex is the target hex file that you downloaded from Unified Engineering. When you're all set, go ahead and flash the hex file to the LPC microcontroller. When the tool reads finished, then ground the reset ISP pin with the button you wired. The oven should chirp and you'll see the Unified Engineering splash screen. If the screen is blank and you accidentally brick the oven, don't worry, this actually happened to me. Try turning the oven on and off. If it's still bricked, turn the oven off, hold down the F1 button and turn on the oven again. This will put the oven in bootloader mode and you can reflash the software to the oven. Right when the flashing is done, make sure that you short the reset node to ground and release. If the oven is still bricked at this point, it might mean the software didn't get successfully written to the oven in such a way where you could put it in bootloader mode with the F1 key. So instead, do the manual method for entering boot mode mentioned earlier by first shorting NISP to ground, then reset to ground, then unshort or float NISP from ground and unshort reset from ground. Then the oven should be in bootloader mode again and you should be able to flash the firmware again. Make sure all the settings and the hardware setup is correct if you're still having problems.
Originally, the oven hardware came with no measurement of the cold junction for the thermocouples, and just assumes that the point is always at 20 degrees Celsius. This is pretty sloppy because at this point can actually vary quite a bit, which is a big reason for the oven's poor performance. In this mod, we'll be adding a temperature sensor to the oven, which in turn is going to be used by the new firmware that we flash to the part. The sensor you need for this mod is called the DS18B20. It should be in the same package that's commonly associated with transistors. We're going to place this temperature sensor right on the terminal block where the thermocouples plug into. This is used to measure the cold junction. The power and ground pins actually will both be soldered to ground on the board. So by the mounting hole, carefully scrape away a small amount of the solder mask to reveal the ground plane underneath. Be careful not to scratch too hard or you'll also remove the copper layer as well. Just scrape just enough so that way a small patch of the green solder mask is gone. Here I also use hot glue to glue the sensor into place onto the terminal block. Solder the two ends of the wire together. Like I said, what you're doing here is soldering the power and ground pins together, which sounds bad, but the sensor has a really cool feature which is called parasitic power mode. Where if VCC is tied to ground, then the sensor will be powered from the one wire open collector interface, which is the center pin. At this point, you'll have to use your dexterity and be careful. The goal here is to solder these two joined wires to the ground plane you exposed. I had to trim the wires a bit here and carefully bend the pins to get as close to the board as possible. Then use your soldering iron to make the connection between the ground plane and the pins. You could optionally solder a wire directly to the plane and solder the other end of the wire to the pins on the sensor. Next, solder a thin wire to the center pin on the sensor. This is probably the hardest section of the mod, which is soldering the 0603 resistor. You could likely get away with a 0805 here as well, but the important thing is that it's a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor. Here you must solder the resistor between these two pads specifically. The pads are VCC and an unused pin on the microcontroller. Once you have the resistor soldered into place, connect the wire from the sensor to the side of the resistor that's closest to the sensor. At this point, you can check to see if your sensor is working correctly. Go to the manual bake mode option and you should see close to the bottom the cold junction sensor readout on the temperature. If the sensor is not functioning properly, what you'll see is a no cold junction connected. The last mod is allowing the new firmware to control the fan that is attached to the side of the oven. This little fan causes a lot of noise and it's really annoying. I'm guessing the intended use was to attempt to keep the cold junction point on the thermocouples as cool as possible. But since we added a sensor to monitor that, then the fan isn't that useful anymore. What we're going to do is add a transistor to control the fan. If the system gets too hot, the microcontroller can just turn on the fan if necessary. First, find the cable that connects the board to the little fan at the side. The pin that is on the inside part of the board is the ground pin. Trim this ground wire a few inches from the connection, but spare the other wire. Now take the transistor with the pins pointing at you in the flat side up. The collector pin will be on the left. The base pin is the center pin, and the emitter is on the right. Solder the collector pin to the trimmed wire that connects to the fan, and connect the emitter pin to the trimmed wire that connects to the ground on the board. Solder a 4.7 ohm resistor to the base pin on the transistor. Route a wire from the resistor to the small via that is labeled ADC0. You can try to protect this transistor from shorts by hot gluing it in place, then wrapping it up in some more Kapton tape. So now that you got your T962 in its final form, you can finally get going on reflowing some circuit boards. Please like and or subscribe if I showed you anything useful, and you can follow me on Twitter to get updates on videos coming up soon or in progress. Thanks for watching.